All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the American Library in Paris' Evenings with an Author program. I'm Catherine Olin, Programs Manager at the Library. For those of you who are just discovering us, we are the largest English language lending library on the continent. That's something we're very, very proud of. But we're more than that, too. We are also a vibrant cultural center and an event space. And so normally we'd be hosting programs like this, you know, twice a week in our space. But for the time being, please do continue to have patience with us and join us on Zoom so that we can all stay safe. Um, we're also an independent nonprofit. So we thrive on the support of our community members as well as our generous donors. And thank you to those of you in the audience tonight who are donors and members and friends and enthusiasts as well. Um, 2020, I have to say, was an interesting year for the library, but it wasn't all bad. We celebrated our centennial in confinement. And so we had a virtual gathering and we were just really impressed by the way the community came together to support us and to to do all they could for for the library even during a very very difficult year for many of us if you'd like to learn more about the american library you can visit our homepage, and we're on sort of all the social medias you can imagine so facebook twitter instagram uh youtube we have a youtube channel where we post uh post the recordings of these events as well so we hope that you do check us out um, so tonight, I am delighted to be joined by Dayan Sujic. He is the Director Emeritus of the Design Museum in London, a critic, curator, and writer. He is the former director of the Venice Architectural Biennale and the editor of Domus Magazine and architecture critic for The Guardian. We'll be hearing tonight about his most recent book, Just Behind Near, which is called The Language of Cities. Uh, it's been published in Chinese, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, and Polish. So, Dayan, I believe you have a PowerPoint for us and we'll, we'll run through sort of an introduction uh, of the book and then I'll be jumping back on to ask you some questions that I've prepared. And in the final portion, we'll be opening it up to the audience and we'll be together for about an hour just so everybody knows what to anticipate. So thank you all for being here and welcome, Dayan. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you all for coming. Um, I think this is a really good time to be talking about cities as we start our second year um, here in London, where I'm speaking from, uh, entering our third lockdown um, on account of the pandemic. Because in some ways, what experience of um, uh, dealing with uh, contagious disease like the um, COVID-19 has been to challenge some of the things that we take for granted about city life. Um, deep down, human beings crave crowds, contact with the social life. And these are sorts of things that um, have taken serious knock uh, in, in the last year. Um, some of the things that we took for granted about city life, about the coming back to life of city centers has been challenged by people being anxious about contagion. The car has become perhaps the ultimate piece of personal protection equipment as we uh, seek to protect ourselves. And yet, uh, for me, the city is mankind's greatest invention. I approach the subject from training as an architect. Many years ago, I studied architecture. Realized it was my patriotic duty thing on the grounds of impatience and incompetence. But it's given me a, a chance to, um, my career as a writer, as a critic, and it's given me a chance to really explore the idea of cities from multiple viewpoints. For me, the city is not something that's created by architects alone, by planners alone, by developers, by politicians, by lawyers. Above all, they're created by people, the people who use them. So the language of cities reflects on what it is that we expect from cities and what we need from them. And I guess also um, tries to understand it from a cultural point of view and also to understand the city is not entirely um, about sweetness and light, that cities really have within them many aspects of what we, we look for them. This image uh, is from the American painter, um, conveying the underside of Manhattan. Oops, of the sorry, subway. I'm just gonna fit in. Are, are you gonna be sharing your, your PowerPoint? We'll, we'll have to do the screen share before that. Sorry, I thought I, I thought I was sharing it. 
No problem. Just go ahead and select that at the bottom okay. of the screen and then. Yeah, yeah. All right, great. Now we can see it if you just play the show. Thank you. Okay, Catherine, are we, are we sharing effectively? Yes, perfect. Great, great. Sorry. Yes, so uh, an image of what city life can be. Um, down at the bottom of Lower Manhattan, when the World Financial Center was completed, there was a series of rather fascinating works of art mission from the American Iranian artist Shia Amajani on some of the open spaces um, below the World Financial Center. And two of the most poignant for me are um, verses from Walt Whitman and um, from Frank O'Hara, cast in cast iron in the railings. And I think they give an insight into some of the qualities that we look for from cities. So the first one is Walt Whitman's um, amazing soaring eulogy. Uh, which reads as follows, um, city of the sea, city of wars and stores, city of tall facades of marble and iron, proud and passionate city, mettlesome, mad, extravagant city. Well, actually, of course, um, Whitman's first two lines from that verse are missing. And for me, they reflect an even more important measure of urbanity of what is the essence of urban life. City, for all races are here, all ends of the earth make contributions here. And it's for me enough a reflection of the fact that cities have all had something which is beyond um, the nations of which they form part. It's the city that counts. We choose to be citizens of a city. National identities are much more exclusive. And another verse which uh, is there at the bottom of Manhattan is from Frank O'Hara, which is um, rather more laconic. Um, O'Hara, the uh, uh, 1960s, 1950s and 60s poet, um, has this rather wonderful reflection. One need never leave the confines of New York to get all the greenery one wishes. I can't even enjoy a blade of grass unless I know there's a subway handy or a record store some other sign that people do not totally regret life. And it's a reminder that cities are reality, a place in which we look for the, the, the unexpected. A city is a messy reality which is never complete. For me, a city is not a work of art. Even artists have been able to show us some very powerful insights into city life. And this is, of course, everyone's favorite Kayabot. Uh, evocation of Haussmann's Paris and understanding Paris and what Haussmann did to it, I think, is, is also important. Um, it was the most magnificent 19th century vision of what urbanity was like, but it wasn't only about what was on the surface, it was also about what happened underground. And let's again, on the theme of the pandemic, remember that one of the reasons that Paris is the way it is now is that throughout the second half of the 19th century, cholera was killing thousands of citizens every summer. And it was only when the drains were installed underneath the boulevards that Hasman built, that, was, uh, that, that health battle was, was overcome. And this image is another kind of uh, insight to what um, an approach to controlling or shaping a city might be. But Mr. Fuller, from the early 1960s, uh, who coined the expression spaceship Earth, who came up with this idea for covering Manhattan with a bubble. Not quite sure whether this was uh, a proposal or perhaps an awful warning alerting us to what happens if we don't look after the ecology of our world. And here's a much, again, on the theme of health, Here's a much more low-tech version of climate control. At the start of the 20th century, tuberculosis and other afflictions led to the pioneering of um, a wide range of open-air schooling to 
give children the benefit of sunshine, but also a healthier atmosphere with this wonderful um, tech form of climate modification, large sun hats, uh, shading uh, pupils. And of course, this was a time in which um, the uh, cities were being reshaped by the modernists. And I think that memory of cholera and the anxieties about tuberculosis were another reason that modernity was so closely associated with hygiene and the idea of Le Corbusier's La Ville Radieuse um, reshaping existing cities by building 60 story high rises in the middle of parkland, an idea which now seems so aberrant and abhorrent to us in terms of its anti urbanism, one can understand where that came from at that time. So there are, I think, uh, not all cities are the same. Cities for me are um, about tolerance and about possibilities and about shaping and about um, freedom of choice. And yet some cities, this is Moscow, have their roots as imperial centers in which at the center of the city is the heart of power, here the Kremlin, uh, and around that is the subservient merchant city. Or here is another model of a city built as an expression of power. This is Beijing laid out with the imperial city at the center to which access was not even allowed by ordinary citizens. City of course here also is a, a diagram of the heavens, uh, Chinese culture uh, very much so it's as a map, as a symbolic representation of their world. Uh, this is a much simpler idea than Oxford of the present day, which has its root in a religious city. Um, the monasteries um, of the Christian period morphed into a university. This is Isfahan, uh, in which uh, the Islamic religious tradition again created a, an urban fabric, which was at one stage uh, the capital of Iran. Or this is a, a insight into a port city. This is Detroit, famous images of Detroit's glory days, um, one of the largest cinemas in the United States uh, at a time when Detroit morphed from being um, a port city on one of the Great Lakes into the world capital of motor car production, a city which found it hard. Successful cities are the ones that don't stick at one role but can actually go on and build another economy. Detroit found it very hard to switch from its dependence on our, uh, it's only just now having lost half its population in the last 50 years, beginning to find a, a new life and a new energy. But other port cities, this is Hamburg, managed to reinvent themselves much more quickly, having uh, more layers to them, more possibilities and, and more resilience. Uh, this image is of course Herzog and the Murons, remarkable construction of a new opera house on top of um, one of the harbour buildings of the 19th century. Or this, uh, the foundation, this is the foundation of St. Petersburg. Peter the Great um, went to Amsterdam to learn the intricacies of shipbuilding, uh, went home to construct a new capital for the Russian Empire uh, in St. Petersburg, the window on the west, um, here is his foundation monument. Here it is today. Um, I think it's really in the way that cities, when how cities are started, some grow um, incrementally, others by um, imperial fiat, or here in the case of Tel Aviv, by a shared endeavor. This is the beach in Tel Aviv around 1900 uh, with um, settlers from the Zionist movement gathering on the beach to decide how to allocate the city for its construction. And here, um, for better or worse, uh, sorry, my, oh yes. Here, for better or worse, is how the city looks, well, looked in the 60s, um, an extraordinary rapid transformation. Um, or here is Brasilia, a city which was deliberately created um, by, Juscelino Kubitschek, president of um, Brazil in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, when he took the decision to reorientate Brazil no longer as a colonial settlement with its major cities on the Atlantic coast, looking back 
but to build a city within the heart of Brazil, uh, in its geographical heart, a city laid out um, by, uh, from the air at a time when there were no roads, with um, Lucia Costa's um, extraordinary modernist city plan and Oscar Niemeyer's powerful architecture, um, a city which seemed such a kind of bold experiment, uh, which was then, with its democratic ideal, then overtaken by governments in Brazil, uh, now is um, somewhat of a, a relic of that period. Or you know, where do ideas about cities come from? And I've been fascinated about the impact of uh, shaping popular imagination through the great exhibitions. Uh, this is uh, an image of the General Motors Pavilion from the, the uh, New York World's Fair of 1909. This is the exterior of the General Motors Pavilion. This was an insight into the inside where visitors were um, presented with a vision of the America of highways at a time when very few had been built, a city of high rises. And uh, this was uh, a similar attempt to do the same thing at the second New York World's Fair in 64 and 65. Um, and here is the equivalent pavilion. Um, this image shows what I sometimes describe as the three horsemen of the urban apocalypse. Um, that's Walt Disney in the back seat. In the front is Henry Ford Jr. to uh, Robert Moses, the man who did to demolish man to save it. A uh, moment when Walt Disney got interested in the idea of urbanism and had some of uh, Moses's plans to help lay out Disney World. Uh, it was a time when planning was still seen as bold gestures in which we believed that the future was going to be better than the past, but it was also a time when um, citizens began to back for the first time. This is Jane Jacobs, um, who managed to stop Moses's bulldozers in their tracks. For the first time, ordinary people spoke up for their right to shape cities in ways that suited them rather than big plans of corporations and mayors. And of course that did um, for many decades reshape, we saw our cities in, in the West. Um, whether it's still appropriate, one sometimes asks, wonders, we now are at a period when we have large scale urban problems we have pro issues that can only be dealt with on big picture thinking, but we're still at the moment when the idea of Jacob's idea of the city, of the street corner, of the eyes that keep the streets safe, still seems so important and drives so many views about what city life might be like. Time when cities have grown larger and larger and larger, um, and at the center of many big cities is a room like this, Manhattan's, um, um, you know, this image kind of reminds me of that image from that scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark, where Hudson Ford braves the map room and finds laid out at his feet this world city. And I guess this view of the city is dangerous. It gives the architect, the master planner, the idea that human beings are on an ant-like scale and the city is their toy to play with and yet it's still very common. This is Shanghai's version, um, which before it redeveloped itself from the 1980s onwards, uh, this is, the, this is the, 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 the Yellow River that divides the city. On the left-hand side with the high-rise model is Pudong, which uh, until 1980 was entirely low-rise and has now got the world's tallest buildings. And this is, Beijing's version where you can actually walk on the city beneath you. And the issue about these is to understand the growing, huge, larger and larger scale of the city. Um, you know, Beijing is probably 20 million people, Shanghai the same. And that's the size of, well, that's larger than many Western European nations. How is it that cities can retain that sense of cohesion? which makes people feel that they belong to a particular city. It becomes harder and harder. Does a city start to balkanize? What are the elements that make a city here? Well, one city or another will have an accent. It will have landmarks or the geography that we recognize and navigate ourselves by. You know, I was born in London a long time ago, 
And for me, that mental map of a city divided by a river with an east end and a west end with north and south of the river is the way that I mentally calibrate most cities that I go to that give me the chance to make sense. Well, how does that work when cities have become quite as large as this? One very apparently banal, simple, ordinary way is the map or the diagram. This is Harry Beck, an electrical engineer working for London Transport in the 1920s, who used the diagram, the, the circuit diagrams of electrical engineering to try and make sense of what London actually was. Uh, the, the, the underground system had become so complex that a straight geographical map uh, was almost unreadable. And he had the very simple idea of using this diagram of spacing all the stations equally apart so you could read them when they're bunched together closely in the center, um, introducing the, the Thames as a kind of guide to do it. And it once became not just a way to understand London, but it became London's logo. It became the way that Londoners understood what they belonged to. It became the way that the rest of the world could understand that city. And as much a kind of sign of what London is, then um, Beck desperately tried to persuade the Parisians to accept a similar map for Paris. Uh, this is uh, his attempt to draw part of the system, but Paris wasn't having any, any of it. And that rivalry, I suppose, between London and Paris, uh, maybe we can talk about that a bit later on, but it is extraordinary how the two cities have taken such different approaches to city planning. London has given the impression of a, a laissez-faire approach Paris has always been more centrally directed, monumental. Um, but on the other hand, London has, invent, has innovated first. Its subway system came well before Paris's, but then Paris built its high-speed RER before we did. And we still have managed to open our latest, which tries to reflect that. But of course, is no longer the way that we understand our cities. We navigate now in very different ways. Um, the map has been supplanted by the smartphone and uh, Google Maps, which go far beyond the way, changing the way that we navigate a city and the way that we understand them. They've also changed our ideas about privacy, about how we meet each other. Um, so if you actually have a, a smartphone, it changes the way that you consume, that you meet people, that you fall in love that you communicate with your kids, the way that you work. It's changing the world in physical ways as well as emotional ones. For me, that, um, that sense of uh, the possibilities a city offers that allows people to choose what they want from it and to let others take what they need from it, but not necessarily to have to work together to live together all the time, begins to disappear. In some ways, you could say that the lack of privacy that the GPS and the smartphone brings means that we no longer have that sense of metropolitan qualities. And I think we need to find ways in which digital world and replicate the physical qualities of metropolitan urban. And then a few ideas about politics in the city. Um, this is Henri Prost, um, a French planner, who was hired by Ataturk to uh, plan the center of Istanbul to make it a more western oriented city and you'll remember um, five or six years ago uh, Istanbul was um, racked with riots about the future of Gezi Park which was um, presented um, in conventional terms as about um, green activists trying to stop a park being built over to create a supermarket. Well that was one level of the story but beneath that was Erdogan's idea about what Istanbul and Turkey should be like and what kind of culture it was. So Ataturk, the creator of modern Turkey, got on Prost to replan Istanbul on a more Western layout. He demolished this large square here, which was an Ottoman era artillery barracks to create the park. And Erdogan's idea was to build a replica of the barracks that had been destroyed to make the park to reassert Erdogan's idea about pre-Ataturk, uh, pre-secular Turkey. And that was what 
the fight was about on many levels. And this is just on the edge of Gezi Park in Taksim Square. This was the Ataturk Opera House, which was a symbol of modern Turkey, which, Ataturk, which um, Ataturk's name was attached to and which Erdogan vowed to remove. And something similar happened in Moscow. Uh, this was the largest church in Russia, the Cathedral of Christ the Savior, um, built by Nicholas II to celebrate um, Russian victory over Napoleon. And Stalin's era um, had that blood um, to make way for this to be the Vatican of socialism, this palace of uh, Soviets uh, designed by an architect whose biography I'm busy writing at the moment. The palace of the Soviets would have been taller than the Empire State Building, topped by representation Lenin larger than the Statue of Liberty. Um, it actually got as far as the uh, floor, but then in 1941, the Germans invaded Russia and construction stopped and was never restarted. And after the war was over and after Stalin's death, uh, Nikita Khrushchev objected not only to Stalin's um, purges and political despotism, but also to his architectural style. So he had the foundations of the palace of the Soviets flooded to create Moscow's largest open air swimming pool, where it remained a poor attraction for 25 years. And then in the new post Soviet Russia, um, the mayor of Moscow, the first mayor of Moscow, the, the Soviet Union, Lushko, um, funded the reconstruction as a facsimile of that church that Stalin had demolished. It's an extraordinary story, and I think it's a, a reminder of how cities are um, used to inscribe histories and symbolic values to show who they are, what they are, and where they've been. Those are very deliberate attempts to shape cities, but I think more often one sees cities as being shaped by uh, laws of unintended consequences. This is London's Docklands. Uh, 1982. At one time, this is one of the busiest upstream docks uh, in the world. Uh, it would have been thick with ships. Here you just see one. Um, and when the docks closed, they were actually um, killed overnight by the invention of a very low tech piece of kit, the shipping container, the standard shipping container, which ended the need for walls around docks and allowed ships to become larger and container ships to become larger and larger. But these upstream docks in city centers were then far too small to take those ships. So harbors shifted downstream towards the sea, leaving all around the world docks like this empty and derelict. And in 1985, London's Greater London Council was so concerned about the future of this and all the jobs it represented, they felt that no one would actually ever want to use this land again. They seriously debated turning this into a, a large park. And then the conservative government of Mrs. Thatcher uh, desperately tried to rescue them by making this land a, um, a planning free zone where normal planning restrictions didn't apply, where um, large scale tax subsidies are offered to persuade anyone to build here. Um, they expected that this would be attracting low in low rise industrial boxes but by complete accident um uh, two restaurateurs the rue brothers got a banker from credit suisse first boston to look at a proposition to build a, um, a coal store here and this banker suddenly realized that the same tax incentives could be used to fund not just low rise sheds but high rise um, office buildings and so in 25 years uh, that turned into this London's second largest financial center and in Europe entirely by accident. And we're now at the moment in which image is still a, a key to how cities look. Um, 25 years ago, the idea that London sacrificed city center was high rise architecture uh, would have seemed crazy. But then um, Ken Livingstone, the first elected mayor, decided that the future of London was as a world financial center. So 
world, Hong Kong, uh, the Gulf, Shanghai, and realized, or he believed anyway, that if London was going to become that worldwide financial hub, it had to look like one and develop that forest of high rises that uh, are, for a moment, the badge of status of a city ambitious to make its mark. Um, some things never change. Uh, this is the fresco of the allegory of good and bad government from the um, Piazza de Popolo in Siena, painted in 1320, which sat in the chamber in which um, Siena's ruling council met. And it was a wonderful reminder of good government here. Um, if city fathers act wisely and well, trade prospers, the city flourishes, building takes place, it's law abiding, students flourish, and bad government, bad things happen, buildings fall down, um, mugged in the fields, cities go empty. Um, and to me, that is a, a, a very important reminder of um, the role that has to play to make cities safe, to uh, think about the future, to think ahead. And that's still important now in dealing with pollution around the world, um, in dealing with the difficulties of um, the, the weirdnesses of cities like Las Vegas. And it's also asking us to think about what civic life means. We've come hugely from the traditional idea of a, a European city with its landmarks in distance of a core. Um, and it's important that we don't simply turn our backs on the Los Angeles model um, until the 60s and the English theorist Rainer Bannum, who wonderfully wrote a book on Los Angeles called The Architecture of the Four Ecologies. He set out, um, as he put it, to he learned to drive so he could read Los Angeles in the original, which I thought was a wonderful way of putting it. But we can't, we, we have to understand how cities like this function as well as cities like Lagos here. This is the street market, um, which um, Rem Kohlhaas, the Dutch architect and urban theorist, has explored year in, year out, much in the way that explored Los Angeles. Facing up also to a new model, Earth is like Silicon Valley, which has become home of the or four of the world's largest and most valuable companies which exist in what appears to be an entirely ex-urban landscape. Um, this is actually Facebook. Um, uh, is this a city at all, or is it something more like a monastery um, in which um, experts spend their days writing code or in the monastery model, working out all the possible names of God? Could these settlements exist at all without the presence of Francisco, a traditional city 50 miles down the road with its airport? and its chance to um, give a taste of the crowded life that we all miss. Or oh, this is its new headquarters, um, the size of a small, not so small town, um, devoted to one single company. This is Google just down the road. Um, and I always love to compare these images with, um, this is the court of Venezia in Milan where uh, Olivetti, a once very powerful electronics company, had its headquarters. And this is where Johnny Ive, Apple's chief designer, that was longer, um, had his design studio uh, in which he had the chance to change the world, unlimited resources to create the smartphones which have changed all our lives, but cut off, marooned in this flying source in the suburb, in the ex suburbs. And is where um, Olivetti uh, kept its designers in the midst of Milan, where they go for an espresso or cappuccino, in which um, Olivetti allowed its designers as to work as independent consultants, so they could um, soak in the atmosphere of the city, they could meet other designers. Um, of course, the difference is that Olivetti, having been one of the most design conscious, powerful electronics companies in the world um, went bankrupt and disappeared. And Apple, I've kept as a prisoner in his cage, um, kept insulated from everything else around him, 
uh, is the most valuable company on the planet. So this is a year when we haven't seen crowds, where crowds, this is um, Cairo during the Arab Spring. Um, this is one of the downsides of crowd life, uh, the kind of uh, over tourism. Um, this is the image of um, the Louvre, um, which has astonishingly been overwhelmed when Pompeii was brought in in the era of uh, um, the 80s to create the pyramid of the Louvre. It was to deal with an unheard of 5 million visitors a year. And now we, until the pandemic, the Louvre was having to cope with an expected 10 million a year. And on one hand, it's wonderful, but it's also terrible. It devalued the meaning of the museum going experience of art and culture. And yet to be human is what is to, is to look for the company of others, to find shared experiences, to be able to switch off our laptops and go and do something with others. And it's something I think we're all hungry to do. Um, let me just finish with this image, uh, which is in London, and which to me embodies some of the really important things about cities, which is number one about tolerance, and number two about the idea of time. Uh, this uh, is a building that was put up in London's East End in Brick Lane uh, in the late 18th century. It's like apple for French. Huguenots fleeing France uh, and the intolerance of Louis XIV. And they came and they were refugees, but they brought their skills to London, uh, weaving skills. And as in so many cases, they set up at first uh, in the poorest part of town in the East End. And then over the generations, they integrated and they moved beyond what was once their ghetto then became a Methodist chapel with a new generation of worshippers. And then at the end of the 19th century, when Jewish migration from mainland Europe um, rose in numbers, uh, what had been a Huguenot chapel and a Methodist church then became a synagogue. And then that generation of migrants who brought their skills and prospered and flourished and made London prosper and flourish again moved on into other parts of the city. As you guessed, this Huguenot church, that is chapel, synagogue, is now a, a, a mosque. Another generation of people adding to the strength of cities and their underlying qualities. Thank you very much for listening. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much, Diane, for this wonderful presentation. It was a an impressive uh, amount of images for such a short amount of time. That was just a fantastic summary of the book. Um, I've turned off your video because we're having a little bit of um, difficulties with your audio. So uh, we, we will just try to continue this way. Thank you to the audience for bearing with us with the connection problems. Um, so I will open up our question period just by doing a couple of my own questions. And then, yes, I see some of you have already submitted um, your own in the chat feature. So feel free to continue doing that and we'll transition to the, the audience Q&A in a few minutes here. All right, so I wanted to open, of course, with a question about Paris, um, which you do treat in the book. Um, and I, I wanted to talk about this in the sense that you describe cities as um, being kind of artworks that are never complete. Um, they're always changing, always having to, to deal with new needs and new populations. Um, but some people, of course, in Paris's past have, have tried to kind of, you know, impose a certain view or one type of vision onto the city. Um, I'm thinking of Haussmann and Napoleon Trois, who you talk about, of course. Um, and to some extent, we're left with their legacies here. So we have the, the very clear um, kind of delineation of Paris with the peripherique running around the edges. And I think those of us who live here are very aware of the fact that those borders are not very porous. Um, there's not a whole lot of exchange between the suburbs and sort of the, the actual, you know, the actual city of Paris. Um, there are different sorts of ways that that limits integration. Um, and I wondered um, 
you know, what your thoughts were on, on this sort of challenge that Paris faces. Of course, I'm sure there are other cities facing similar challenges. And if there were any solutions that certain cities have come up with that have been, you know, great successes celebrated in the last years. Well, Paris has a reputation for large ideas uh, and London tries to pretend it doesn't have large ideas. You know, London pretends to be quite a kind of gentle place where not much happens, but actually, as you can see in the last 20 years, its eruption of high rises suggests that it's actually ruthless about things. Um, and uh, profit is pretty important to that. But as I was touching on in, in my talk, there has been a, a constant to and fro between London and Paris, Paris and London. Uh, let's not forget that Napoleon III was in exile in London and he saw Nash rebuilding London for the Prince Regent, creating um, Regent's Park, cutting Regent Street, um, the name's a bit of a clue, through um, historic core. And when Napoleon III went home, of course, he got Houseman to do it, but on a bigger and better scale. Uh, and you can see those big ideas continuing. So La Défense, is in some ways London's Canary Wharf, but La Défense built, well, France being what France is, the rapid rail link was built to La Défense first, and the towers came. And France being what France is, um, it, the president could order state financed or part state owned enterprises to go and set up shop there. Whereas uh, in Canary Wharf, Mrs. Thatcher broke her promise to the Reichman brothers, to the developers for Canary Wharf to actually move civil servants out there and to pay for um, the subway system to be extended there. So um, the, in, in theory, that French idea of coherent organized planning um, should be a, 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 a good thing, a strong thing. Um, the problem perhaps is that it's become too hard with um, the heroic figure of the president, the individual. Uh, you know, let's not forget that um, uh, a certain president described himself when talking about um, Leal as l'architecte en chef, c'est moi. Um, let's not forget that our defense was Bill Lamarche, who had the largest crane in France shipped to La Defense with a mock-up of the top of La Grande Arche hoisted into place so you could get a look at how it would seem when viewed from the garden of the Elysee Palace. Um, those strong men plans uh, only work sometimes and I suppose Paris is still trying to solve those ideas. Um, you know, the, uh, the current mayor when she entered office, did have quite a um, uh, imaginative dialogue with a number of major architects about ways of trying to overcome that um, peripheric moat problem. Uh, the uh, so, so far, not much of which has materialised. Um, I, I suppose it was it was a a trap, the, 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 the circular beltway, which actually is a very much a North American feature too, is so rigid and the, the contrast between the historic core and Houseman's Paris and what's beyond that is so stark um, that it seems really hard to understand how it can be fixed. Um, but it it's, goes beyond architecture and planning, it goes to the way that um, uh, Britain and France see multiculturalism in different ways. Um, and I think it's an understanding that there are no, I mean, there are no quick fix solutions. Cities are to be shaped on longer term um, perspectives than mayoral, mayoral elections. Um, politicians are far too fond of being photographed unveiling things or setting the bulldozers to work um, rather than understanding that some untractable problems 
take a long time and a lot of work. I haven't answered the question. Oh, you have though. Thank you very much. You've uh, you've answered it expertly. I, I really appreciate that generous answer. Um, should I go ahead and move on to the next one, or did you have any any other thoughts you were getting to? I don't want to cut you off. Sure. Okay, great. So, um, so I think a lot of people are are curious to hear more about your thoughts um, about the city in in the current context with the you know the the outbreak, the global pandemic. Um, I noticed in your in your book that you did talk about, of course, cholera. Um, you also talked about the difficulties of pollution, uh, the challenges that brings to populations and cities, as well as the future challenges we will face. Uh, with climate change. Um, and I found it really interesting that you talked about kind of these mega metropolises, um, you know, cities of sort of 40 million plus as being experiments because we really have no long-term understanding of what, uh, what these cities might be or the, the real challenges we'll face with them. And I thought that, you know, COVID-19 is kind of a, a perfect time to, to take stock um, of what these cities can be and how they can also become in a way kind of nightmarish landscapes. But in a more positive note as well, um, I wondered if you could touch on the city's resilience because I think that a lot of us were seeing these sort of catastrophic articles about the death of the city, especially New York City and how you know, people were leaving and escaping the pandemic and they would never come back, but that's not really been the case. People are returning to cities, so. Do you do you share that optimism that cities will be resilient, that this will be a be something that we can we can come together and rebuild? Or how are you feeling right now in this moment about the future of big cities? I, I think density is so so key to this. Um, on the, on the one hand, in good times, a dense city is one which offers you limitless possibilities any restaurant you like, any culture you want to become part of, any music scene, any kind of choice. Uh, it's density which actually makes a mass transit system possible, which is what makes low pollution possible. And yet what we've seen from the pandemic is that people have been public transport because they're scared. They've been to their cars. Um, they've been acquiring, which has pushed back pollution levels. They've started to look at moving out of town. It's brought home the inequalities of being locked down is a very different experience for someone who has a London townhouse on five floors with a garden, uh, which they can uh, hide from their kids who are homeschooling on the top floor and they can use the garden and that's a very different experience from having three kids in two rooms uh, with no outdoor spaces and having to go to work because you are actually in a low income um, occupation which has very little social security and demands that you go to work. This is really really tough and these are very very different ways of experiencing the pandemic and they're reminding us about the inequalities which are have always been present but which are now being sharpened impact is being worsened um, I, I think that the ideas that we carry in our heads about cities will reshape the way that we understand the city and I don't think that there's going to be an immediate bounce back to where cities had been uh, five years ago where the model was young people thought that the, uh, the city where the affluent looked for the city centre. I think that model is, is going to change. There could be some good things to that. One of the big problems of cities has been the affluent classes wanting to return to the city centre, raising prices, pushing out those who can't afford to be there. Um, that plus Airbnb phenomenon, which has again taken rental places off the market. And one could hope that um, a long term pack might be that by reducing rents uh, in city centres, it might allow more diversity, more flexibility, more possibilities of change. One of the things about 
affluence is that um, it's very hard to to turn back because so many um, economic instruments are based on land values. And if land values start to fall, we are told that it's going to hurt our pension funds. But of course, um, it may be a way in which you actually bring um, a, a new sense of life into a city centre. But so there, there are multiple things going on at the same time. So I don't know about Paris, but in London, certainly the affluent have camp for their country home, their country second homes, um, taking the disease with them, um, upsetting their year round neighbors, leaving the center of London really empty. Um, it was really spooky in the first lockdown to actually go to the city of London. It was like being in a European post apocalyptic movie, completely empty street. Um, and that's still pretty much the bankers, the brokers, the traders, are working from home. Um, they will sooner or later, most of them go back to their offices um, simply because uh, people, are, people are driven by that need for human company and they want to get away from their kids as well. But it's meaningful for the less, the less affluent, the poorer. Um, it could be much problematic and much more difficult. Certainly, um, we need to think about the size of housing. Um, you know, we've actually been making um, smaller and smaller apartments. Well, that's harder and harder support. There's very little flexibility. There's very little resilience in that housing type. All right, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add that it was similar here in Paris. We had a, you know, I, I don't know, it seemed like sometimes half of the population had fled to their country homes. And as I walked around, I also noticed that the the top floors um, of the apartments, so sort of the chambre de bonne or the maids quarters, the old maids quarters would be lit up at night and the other sort of bigger, more expensive uh, flats in the same buildings would be dark. So those people were not at home. So as you say, it kind of pointed out the inequalities. Um, let's go to some audience questions. So thank you for those of you who have submitted and please continue to do so. Um, so I have one from Jacqueline here who's writing, we all love Paris, but some are critical of it being a uh, ville musée. How can we strike a balance between overdevelopment in places like London and a Venice-like place with limited housing and sort of nothing new? Um. I think the answer is, is, is multiple. Um, cities have a future when the various voices shape them work together. And I began by saying that a city is not made by architects, it's not made by planners, it's not made by highway engineers, it's not made by investors, it's not made by politicians, it's not made by its people, it's made by all of these groups but too often they don't speak to each other or they positively dismiss each other and that sense of trying to understand that it's a shared experience is so important what a city is so it's image of um, the allegory of good and bad government good government siena built its universe 1400 it had a police force that kept the place secure around the same time that sense of taking a long-term view of working with groups of understanding that a city depends not just on its plumbing but on its culture um, not just on its lawyers but on its cafes that a healthy city is one which actually is not frozen but is able to shift to, sh to shape it to reshape itself to add balance that's a city that can thrive and survive and I have to say that um, Britain's inexplicable decision to leave the European Union has opened up a lot of opportunities for Paris. Um, you know, it's, an, it's a natural financial centre, it's a natural cultural centre. Um, quite snooty about not speaking French though. Yeah, thank you for bringing that into, uh, into the mix here. We do have a question about any changes you might expect uh, post-Brexit. I'm not sure if that applies specifically to London or um, yeah, if you have any thoughts about that. Um, well, it's incredibly sad. Um, 
but we've got to make the best of it now uh, in Britain. Um, I mean, really shocking things like leaving the Erasmus scheme uh, is just terrible news. Uh, purely um, self serving uh, note for architects, um, British qualifications no longer recognized for architecture in mainland Europe. So um, would another Pompidou center be feasible? Um, uh, maybe Richard Rogers these days wouldn't be an associate architect, it was French. Um, I, I guess it's um, in, in the long term, what does Europe become um, without Britain? Um, it becomes a more complex uh, relationship between Germany and France, um, between Germany's dispersed cities and France's more centralized ones. Um, the financial center in London, which has dominated Europe, is certainly under challenge. Heathrow Airport is now no longer the most busy airport um, in Europe. Uh, who knows what will happen after flights increase again, but again, that sense of, um, uh, I mean, London as a kind of European hub as a center is under challenge. There's a fantasy among members of the Conservative Party in Britain that somehow we will become um, Singapore, um, which of course is a city-state of four million people. London might be a city-state, um, but afford to be. Um, I mean, that's an interesting reflection. I guess one can say that um, one of the reasons that Britain decided to leave was some kind of um, payback time for the rest of Britain, um, resentful of London's success and prosperity. And London, of course, um, has existed far longer than anything that could be called England has. It was started by Italian migrants 2000 years ago uh, and has prospered on migration ever since. And that's been seen as a challenge and a threat to some parts of, of England. Um, where that goes in future, we have yet to see. But um, the next step could be Britain itself splintering. Um, I think there's very few reasons for the French, for the Scots to want to stay um, with England. Um, and, you know, we can foresee a referendum, another referendum on that quite soon, uh, uh, which will leave all kinds of issues, um, not least what happens to Britain's nuclear deterrent, which at the moment is based uh, in Scotland primarily. But too depressing to talk about. Let's let's look for a more optimistic view of the city. We have to be positive. We have to be positive. That's right. I think a good question to end on then would be one from Pauline, um, who's interested to hear more of your insights uh, on cities post COVID. Um, so she's asking, you know, will there be a reclaiming of urban public spaces as gathering spaces? And what changes can we hope to see, such as more green spaces, no card zones, uh, limits on mass tourism? Um, I'll give you a chance to to kind of maybe wrap up on that question then. I suppose what the last year has done is give us a chance to reflect on what it is that we need and from our cities. Uh, there was great two months when those of us who did have enough room to escape homeschooling uh, could look at our cities and hear birdsong and see pollution levels disappear. Uh, it was really um, uncanny to see London's high rises in sharp focus, realizing that traffic pollution had made such a difference the way the place looked. And that's given us a chance to think what we would like from cities um, and to hope that as we reshape them, um, we can do all those things. Um, the bicycle has an immense future. Um, the idea of bicycle lanes will survive. Um, we will get back to trusting public transport again sooner or later. It won't happen at once. And we have to understand that there will be a period of, of disruption um, when we have to um, make the case again for those shared facilities. Uh, but uh, a walkable city, a city in which you can find everything 
within a 20 minute walk, um, but there's actually a theater at one end of that walk and um, a bar at the other end where you can meet your friends. That's a very powerful urban ideal. And which I'm looking forward to very much to rediscovering. Absolutely. And we can hope that 2021 and beyond will bring some of these changes. Um, I'm going to go ahead and try to turn your video back on just before we, we say goodbye here to see if the, the connection is stable enough. I think it gave you a notification. Um, great. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Diane. It's been wonderful to hear from you and uh, have you answer our questions as well. Um, maybe one final question would be, do you have a preferred bookseller for your book or do you have any ideas for where people can purchase it if they would like to? Uh, my God. Um, Not to put Paris, you on the spot. I couldn't actually answer <laughs> that question. But I'm not, I'm not going to mention a certain giant that's headquartered in, um, up in the on the west coast of America. That's totally fine. So it's a, it's available widely online, we can assume. And then of course, in if you're local in Paris, there's the Red Wheelbarrow Bookstore, um, whom we were often using yeah. as a partner for our in-person events. Also Shakespeare and Company, WH Smith. Um, and then I'm sure you have many favorites in London, but I think it's time to wrap up here. So before I let everybody go, I wanted to thank you for being such a wonderful engaged audience. You all had excellent questions. We couldn't get to all of them tonight, unfortunately, but thank you for being here. Um, and also uh, I wanted to remind you that the American Library in Paris is of course an independent nonprofit, which means we do welcome donations. So if you enjoyed tonight's program, um, I invite you to go ahead and use that link um, to donate that went out in the email, uh, the the same email with tonight's Zoom link. So if you're interested in supporting the library, uh, we generally welcome donations of about 10 euros per person per event. So if that's something that, that you think you might like to do, I, I invite you to go ahead and, and do so this evening. And thank you so much. And uh, also be sure to, to browse our upcoming events for January and February, which are on our homepage right now. And you can sign up in the same fashion that you did for tonight's event. Um, so thank you again to Diane Sujic and to our audience. It's been wonderful to spend the evening with you. Catherine, thank you. And thank you to the audience. Bye-bye. Thank you until next time. <laughs>